a ninja outfit. The early 1990s was a very tumultuous period for WCW, especially when it came to who was at the very top of the food chain, the EVP of the company. There was a lot of turnover during that time period. Of course, there was the Jim Hurd era. It was apparently so bad that it got Ric Flair to up and quit while he was champion. You've got the Bill Watts era, which had its own highs and lows. But what about that sweet middle point, the K. Allen Fry era? That's what we're focusing on today when I talk about this week's classic review, WCW Super Brawl 2 from Leap Year Day, February 29th, 1992 at the Mecca Arena in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This show was nominated by Ben Davies and Adam Vanderplum over at Patreon.com slash Wrestling with Regret. First off, let's talk about the venue here and how it looks. I always like looking outside of the confines of like a wrestling set to look at the venue itself to see just what kind of fun little features it has. I dig the old theater stage surrounding the entranceway here, the way the rafters look and up at the upper decks. Very cool old style here. 5,000 folks in attendance here, 160,000 pay-per-view buys, and we open the show with about seven minutes of pure talking. Tony Schiavone, Eric Bischoff, they lead things off. We go to Missy Hyatt backstage, Jim Ross in the ring. He welcomes the new broadcast colleague, Jesse the Body Ventura, who wheels in on a Harley Davidson. Well, damn, I guess that actually was an accurate point in the Jesse Ventura story. Then when those guys get done talking, we go back to Schiavone and Bischoff for a minute because everyone's talking here, and we just didn't have hype packages to really kind of pad for time back in the day. Talking was all we had in the early 90s, but it's okay because the first actual match we get here in this show is truly an all-time classic. It's for the light heavyweight championship. Don't get used to seeing that much longer as Jushin Thunder Liger defends against Flying Brian Pillman, the former champion. The match starts out fast here by Brian with some arm drags and such. We got a double drop kick at a standoff. Jesse says Liger reminds him of the Predator. Liger with the moonsault onto Pillman. Cool fake out move off the ropes. You don't see that very often in 92. Brian's got to go to the ropes to escape the surfboard a couple of times. Big old dropkick in the corner. I also like Liger's cool twist into a sunset flip here. Liger puts Pillman in the figure four leg lock. We get some slaps. The holds counter. The ref's got to pull him apart himself. Pillman attempts a fiery comeback. Liger cuts him off and comes at him with a flying senton. On the apron, Pillman blocks a turnbuckle attack. Hits a flying clothesline. He suplexes Liger out of the ring. Hits another dive to follow up. Then he goes for another attack, lands on the barricade. Liger goes for a flying nothing, but it's intercepted. We get the double missed drop kick again, and they double down. Ah, comes full circle. We get a double missed heel kick as well. Big dive off the top by Pillman. Two and three quarters. Suddenly the two have what looks to be a video game glitch, and we get a kick out. Superplex by Liger. He goes to the splash, but he misses. Pillman with a roll up to win the match and the title, and yay, sportsmanship. And yay, this match as well. Four and a half stars out of five. Like I said, this is just an all-timer. So far ahead of its time. The stuff you see in this match here was just not the norm in 92. We kind of look at that today and think it's kind of old hat, but like that's the building blocks. A match like that, think of how many young kids were watching that in attendance and watching on TV and saying, oh, that's what I want to do when I get older and be a wrestler. That, I'm sure, influenced so many people, that match alone. And it's also crazy to think it's not too long after this, just a few months later, that Bill Watts would come into the company, look at what he had, and say, no, nah, let's just get rid of all the stuff that made these guys cool. We hear once again from Tony and Eric, awesome show, great job. They toss backstage to Missy Hyatt, who's interviewing the tailor-made man in his big old Ted DiBiase pajamas. Terry says he tried to recruit Marcus Bagwell and take him under his wing, but Marcus didn't want that. Cool line by Terry here where he says, I was going to teach you how to be a winner, now I'm going to teach you how to be a loser. It's a good closing line, but I was watching this interview and it dawned on me, you know the reason Terry Taylor never really crossed that threshold and became a bigger star? Just look at his eyes, totally dead up there. We go now to the winner of the guest ring announcer contest, Barry Abrams from Syracuse. Look at that combo there, the tuxedo top and jacket, basketball shorts underneath. Our next match sees Marcus Alexander Bagwell taking on the Taylor Made Man. Jim Ross mentioning that Taylor is one half of the U.S. Tag Champs alongside Greg Valentine, who is not here on the show, nor is the belt. Taylor starts off with a headlock, Bagwell selling in a really weird way with his hand on his hip. Marcus catching Taylor off guard, they start mouthing off to each other and getting chippy. Bagwell goes in a nice 
Smith's run. Big top rope cross body. Taylor powders for a moment on the ramp. The action spills to the outside. Terry throws Buff into the barricade. Hits him with a big old right hand. Back in the ring, Taylor just bullying Bagwell, staying on the offensive. Buff going for a sunset flip, and there's a lot of air there. The crowd gets on them for that. Taylor hits a big top rope splash, but it's a two count. They struggle their way into a roll up. The referee counts the three. Bagwell and Taylor keep going as if it was a two count, but the match did indeed end. Taylor takes his frustration out on the poor kid for his botch and goes on his merry way. I give this one one and a half stars out of five. I mean, I will give Terry Taylor credit. I gave him his flowers the last time I reviewed a match of his from 87. He did his best here. Marcus still pretty green around the gills, and uh, they tried, but it just didn't pull off that well. And that ending with the box three count, uh, or there wasn't supposed to be a three count, it sure was unfortunate. Backstage once again with Missy Hyatt outside Lex Luger's locker room. She wants to get a word with the champ, but then in comes his manager, Harley Race. He says Luger's in the best shape of his life, and that tonight he's the champion, Tomorrow he'll be the champion because he is the champion. Can't argue with that logic. Up next, Cactus Jack taking on the big man Ron Simmons wearing those FSU colors. These two have been feuding for the last couple of months, usually in a series of tag team matches with different partners. Jack recently had a falling out with his partner, Abdul the Butcher, and Abby's even helped Simmons out on a couple of occasions in the build here. The fists are flying soon after the bell rings. Cactus doing the hangman spot right out the gate, fighting in and out of the ring. Simmons with a face buster. Jack hits back with a big clothesline. We see the junkyard dog in his finest tuxedo there watching in the audience. Jesse and I had the same thought that maybe he's the usher for the evening. Back to the outside they go. Jack slams Ron to the floor, then does that big ol' elbow drop off the second rope and onto the floor. It's always painful to watch, but so captivating at the same time. Simmons goes for a drop kick, but Jack grabs the ropes. He does hit it a few minutes later, though. Goes for a charge, but flies through the ropes and onto the ramp. Jack following him out, but he eats a spine buster on there. By the way, shout out to that person who had to add some real estate to their sign when they ran out of room. Back in the ring, Jack flies off the turnbuckle, but he's caught in midair, and Simmons slams him for the three count. I love that finish there. Suddenly, Abdul the Butcher shows up and beats up Simmons. Turns out that he and Jack are a team once again. Down comes a junkyard dog, and now we see he was wearing jeans below that cummerbund. He helped save the day. I give it three stars out of five. I like this match for what it was. Two big guys just beating the hell out of each other, having a brawl. You love to see it. Even though some of the stuff that Foley does at this point in his career, you can't help but cringe knowing like how it's going to contribute to his long-term health down the line. Uh, it's still really fun to watch in the moment. And, you know, still makes his opponents look like beasts for absorbing that and, for in Simmons' case, going on to win. And if you want to find out what happens in the fallout of this aftermath where JYD comes in and Abdul the Butcher comes in, if you want to find out where this all leads to, or where it doesn't, you can watch my WrestleWar 92 review. Up next, a real universe mode match on hand here as Vinny Vegas and Richard Morton team up to take on Van Hammer and the Z-Man. This feels like a very random pairing of guys here in this matchup, but it turns out there's a reason for it because two guys in this match are substitutions. The Z-Man's filling in for Johnny B. Bad, and then you've got Ricky Morton filling in for Mr. Hughes. And it has to be said, Richard Morton is doing the most half-assed heel turn of all time, where he's like, I'll turn heel, but I won't change anything about my look or my gimmick, but I'll do this money hand gesture more. But poor Richard, though, the guy is easily the most qualified and experienced man, more so than the other three people in this match combined. Van Hammer with a big press slam to Morton. He gives Vegas an arm drag, which why would you arm drag a seven-footer? It looks so weird. Big, ugly lockup between the two of those guys, like giant immobile bulls. They hit the ropes, and Vegas goes for a leapfrog, but Hammer just headbutts him in the stomach, the camera catching Hammer, telling Vinny to hit him. Z-Man with a missile dropkick onto Vegas. Nice sequence here where Z-Man knocks Morton out of the ring, dives onto him on the outside, hip toss onto the floor. Some double teaming from Vegas and Morton on Van Hammer. He and Vinny go for a suplex that looked more dangerous than some Canadian destroyers I've seen, but we also get this big ass boot right in the collarbone. The two big guys bonk heads in the middle of the ring and go down. A double hot tag and Z-Man all over Morton hits the roll up out of the corner to pin and win. I give it one star out of five. It's not really that bad a match when you consider the factors going into it. You got two guys who are super green and you got two other guys who are substitutions. And so they have to kind of make do with what they have. So I'll give them credit for putting something passable together. But, you know, Van Hammer, Kevin Nash, they're just not there yet. Especially, you know, Van Hammer, I don't think ever gets there. But, Van, but Kevin Nash does get better. Speaking of Hammer, though, I will say that cool backflip camera move they have for his entrance, someone needs to bring that back. Uh, Morton and Zank did a great job as 
that's kind of like carrying this match the best they could. They didn't spend nearly as much time as they should for the two more experienced guys. You had like Hammer and Vegas spending most of the time in the matchup. Can you imagine how this match would have gone if everything went according to plan and you had Johnny B. Bad and Mr. Hughes in there? Up next, big grudge match here as Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes take on stunning Steve Austin and Larry the Cruncher Zabisco. Love that nickname. It's the name that Zabisco gave himself after he and Art Anderson attacked Barry Windham at Halloween Havoc the previous year where they crunched the bones in his hand of that car door attack. Windham came back. It's been working alongside Rhodes and Ricky Steamboat as well to fight the dangerous Alliance members as the weeks have gone on. What is the deal with Austin's knee pad here? I think it's supposed to be that early 90s medical greenish gray, but it just looks dirty. Austin gets knocked around by both Rhodes and Windham. They're all over him. Barry's begging for Larry to come in and we finally get it. The action goes to the ramp. Pile driver attempt is reversed. Windham with a big DDT and what a great bump. Larry takes a lot of offense here. Windham thrown over the top with the referee's back turn though. Austin with a leaping attack onto the floor. Drops him right on the railing. Windham's own momentum's got him flying out of the ring for more damage. He gets worked over for a good long while. We get another accidental head collision which leads to a double down. Windham leans back and tags in Rhodes. House of Fire. Dustin with a big bump off the clothesline. Now he's the one taking the heat. Medusa hanging out on the outside. Hits the slap. That Jezebel. Rhodes stalks her up the ramp but then takes a clothesline. Look at how Rhodes and Austin hit those ropes before we get the big cross body. Dustin takes some more abuse but he's able to drop Austin into the ropes. The cruncher comes in but Rhodes able to tag in Wyndham. Wyndham's on Zabisco. We get ready for the superplex. Larry pushes him off but Rhodes dumps Zabisco tit for tat. Wyndham with the top rope lariat and the win. Four stars out of five for me on this one. Just an excellent tag team match. Great storytelling. Just some classic work between four of the best workers in that or any era, I would argue. I think one thing they could, I thought was kind of a missed opportunity was not enough heat on Wyndham's hand because it's very heavily taped up. They make allusions to it on commentary that it's still hurt, but they don't really spend a lot of time in the match working the hand. Kind of a missed opportunity there. Either way, still a great match and probably would have been the best match of the night had it not been for Pillman and Liger. Eric Bischoff, the Detroit native, wearing the Michigan jacket to show his homerism for the Steiners for our next match. But first, Missy wants a word with Ricky Steamboat backstage, so she comes across the Ninja, who's been seen the last few weeks keeping Steamboat company. They open the door and we see Ricky doing some kind of big fire meditation ritual. That can't be safe to do indoors like that. The Ninja freaks out and sends Missy away. She turns around and we find Medusa back from the last match. Medusa tries to flirt with the Ninja to get to Steamboat, but the Ninja's not having any of this. She repeats herself a bunch, finally slaps the ninja, then he chases her off. Up next for the WCW World Tag Titles, got beautiful Bobby and Arn Anderson of the Dangerous Alliance taking on the Steiner Brothers here. It was the team of Wyndham and Steamboat who first beat the Enforcers, Anderson and Zabisco, for the tag belts at Clash of the Champions back in November. But at a house show in January, you had Anderson and Eaton beat those guys for the tag belts. That brings us to this one here. Before the match begins, we hear that Kay Allen Fry, the EVP, has barred Polly dangerously from ringside and he's in a tizzy. Medu Medusa shows up, presumably having escaped the ninja backstage, and now she's in the baddies' corner. Eaton and Scott with some back and forth early on. Steiner catching Bobby, mid-flying nothing, and hits a suplex. Some good stuff with Rick and Arn here. Steiner's definitely in Arn's head with his dog-like shenanigans. Scott and Arn exchange holds. Scott flips out of a double wrist lock, and Rick hits a double Steiner line. Scott's thrown outside. The Dangerous Alliance tries to put a hurting on him, but it backfires. On the ramp, Bobby bounces off the ropes, and Scott hits a tilt-a-whirl slam. Some guys in the crowd now chanting, break his back and we want blood. Sort of a doomsday device by the Steiners here. Rick goes the top rope bulldog but lands right into a low blow. Eaton and Anderson take over for a bit. Scotty's in now but he gets cut off. Arn throwing Scott into his own partner Bobby for some more damage. Bobby with a beautiful knee drop from the top rope. We get a two count. More good teamwork against Scott. Referee is distracted as Arn and Bobby hit the rocket launcher on the ramp. Arn wants to throw Scott back into Bobby's knee but it backfires and now Rick's been tagged in. Arn's got Rick on his shoulders and Bobby goes for a dive, but Rick kind of catches him and slams him, reminiscent of WrestleMania 9. The pin's broken up. Top rope Bulldog, pin's broken up again. Medusa gives Arn some mysterious white powder and it's thrown in Steiner's face. The blinded wrestler hurls the referee on accident. New ref comes in. Scott hits the Frankenstein.
Frankensteiner on to Bobby, who is not the legal man. The cover and the win. The Steiners are declared the new champions. Or are they? It's the old dusty finish, folks. The Steiners are disqualified and the Alliance remain the tag team champions. I give it three and a half stars out of five. Despite the disappointing dusty finish, I still think it was a great match. These guys had great chemistry together. I think the finish was highly entertaining. Seeing the referee just go from pillar to post like that in the suplex was a lot of fun to watch. I think that, you know, the more I'm watching these uh, WCW shows from this era, seeing those dusty finishes happen almost like once every time I'm doing it, it does get kind of old and it shows you why that finish got so played out and is so not fun anymore, not great to experience when it happens so often. But be that as it may, still a solid match. We see Ricky Steamboat making his way to the ring accompanied by his friend the Ninja. Then we go to the U.S. Championship match as Steamboat challenges Ravishing Rick Rude. Back in November at Clash of the Champions, Sting was the U.S. champ, but he was jumped by the world champion and former best friend Lex Luger, sent to the hospital. Sting barely made it back in time to defend the belt again against Rude, but he ultimately lost the championship. And of course, Rude is the crown jewel of the Dangerous Alliance that began forming in October of the previous year, as we saw when Rude was the WCW Halloween Phantom. At the next Clash of the Champions, Sting and Steamboat beat Rude and Anderson in a tag match, but Rude took the dragon out of action with multiple Rude Awakenings, setting in motion this title match. Paul Lee is also barred from ringside at this match as well, important to point out. Some great heat on Rude. He can't even tell these sweat hogs to keep it down so he can disrupt robe. They are drowning him out with booze. Some quick back and forth to start things off. The ninja conspicuously sitting at ringside trying to hide his face from the camera as this match goes on. Rude selling his arm in a major way as he tries to mount an offense. He is still able to slam Ricky around. Hits a big clothesline and a back suplex, but the dragon fights back. He gets Rude in the figure four. Rude's able to break the hold. Comes down off the top rope a couple of times as Jesse says, there's always time for posing when you're Rick Rude, gorilla. Rude with the chin lock, but Steamboat's able to get Rude onto his shoulders, drop him with the electric chair. Hitting the ropes, we get a mid-air collision and both men are down. I'm pretty sure that is at least the fourth time tonight an accidental collision like a noggin knock spot is used as a double down on this show alone. Ricky counters a sleeper into one of his own, but it gets countered up on the top rope. Steamboat with a big superplex, but a kick out at two. Dragon's on a huge run at this point. He wants to finish Rude off, but suddenly the ninja gets on the apron, pulls out a giant cell phone, and dinks Steamboat with it. Rude covers and wins, retains the championship. Ross saying the ninja was waddling away like an old woman. It had to be Polly in disguise, right? I also give this one three and a half stars out of five. Very solid match here with the two of them. I love the selling that each man has, especially Rude for the arm and whatnot. I mean, just great work with the two of them overall. The fact they kept cutting away to the ninja at ringside while also telling you, oh, Paulie's going to be barred from ringside. You won't be seeing him in this matchup. Well, you know, it's like it's a definite red flag and a dead giveaway. That's what's going to happen. I had not seen this match or this show before watching it for the review and I could, oh, that's what's going to happen. And sure enough, but even that wasn't enough to really take away from the work that Steamboat and Rude did. These guys would have a better match though at Beach Blast 92. And sure enough, we go backstage. Missy wants to interview Rude after the match. She opens the locker room door and we see Paul E under the ninja costume. What a scandal. So hang on. If Paul was supposed to be barred from ringside by Kip Allen Fry and he shows up there anyway under disguise and the disguise is later revealed, then wouldn't legally, wouldn't Paul E and Rude be totally screwed right now? In your main event for the WCW World Championship, you got Lex Luger, big as a house, defending against his former best friend, the man called Steve. Sting. It was Luger who jumped Sting back at the Clash, admitted he was paying multiple guys to try and take Sting out of wrestling. Sting got a measure of revenge at Starcade when he beat Luger in the Battle Bowl, and that's how we got to this big title match. Luger has not been seen at all for the last uh, month or so going into this show, and you can see what he's been doing with his time. He's been pumping that air pump, brother. He's been getting full of the gas, and he is ready for a run with the WBF. But before he does that, though, he's got to drop the belt to Sting, the belt that Luger won in Ric Flair's absence. This took, you know, back at Great American Bash 91, it was Luger and Wyndham in the cage for the championship. Wyndham, last minute replacement. Luger winning that match, winning the championship, turning heel, and now this is supposed to be kind of the emotional apex of this storyline. Luger and Sting, it's, it's well known. They're really good friends, or they were. And despite all that, there's really, you know, there's no build for this. 
because Luger's been gone for the last month getting ready for his, his burgeoning bodybuilding career. They even asked on commentary, how does a man get that much size in only 30 days? Hmm, I wonder. To me, the high point of this match was right after the bell rings and before they even lock up when they're just standing in the ring and having this like conversation. You don't know what they're saying. I can't read lips and it's not mic'd up or anything. But to me, it just felt like it's, you know, Sting is frustrated at Luger because the title's driven this wedge between the two of them. And this conversation feels like, yeah, we're about to do this. You know, all this friendship out the window, up in smoke, because we're going to have this fight now. Let's do it. And I loved that. I mean, that was the story that I kind of painted in my head, but that was a lot better than the story they told in the ring after they started locking up. Sting hits a splash early on, but Luger shakes it off and counters with a huge clothesline out of the corner. Big Slam already calling for the torture rack, but Sting fights out of it. We get the rack on Luger for a second. Sting goes to the Scorpion Deathlock, but Luger is able to escape to the ropes, gets his momentum back, wearing down the Stinger, hits his opponent with a low blow the referee misses. Luger with a feckin' sloppy looking pile driver. Didn't get all of it, says Jesse. Sting starting to come back, throwing hands, rubs Luger's face into the canvas. Luger begging off, oh no, not the back rake. Goes for a running attack, but he goes flying over the top rope instead. On the outside, Harley Race goes for a pile driver on the Stinger, but he fights out of it. Top rope cross body, the cover, the three count, that was abrupt. Sting wins and becomes the world champion for the second time in his career. Well, the streak of good Lex Luger matches on this channel has come to an end. I give this one two stars out of five. It was an okay match, just like not befitting that of a pay-per-view main event for the championship between two former best friends turned bitter rivals, as the tagline of this pay-per-view suggests. It was just, you know, there's so much drama you could get from this, and there just wasn't there because, like I mentioned, Luger was gone for the month before this show because he was getting ready for WBF, and he just wasn't on TV. You don't have that interplay. Play, you don't have that emotional pull, and it's just it shows that you don't have it here because, and you know, Luger seems to have phoned it in. I'm not gonna lie, it's just not a great Luger match. He does his job, does the business, and gets on out of there. Definitely not Sting's greatest world championship victory, especially when you compare it to his last one against Ric Flair at the Great American Bash. Um, yeah, not much else to say about it. This was just kind of a disappointing main event, even by Lex Luger standards. That being said, I still consider this to be a real superb roll. I give the show a B minus grade overall. A couple of weird things in there, a couple of matches you could do without, but I think of course Pillman and Liger really setting the bar high with that great match of theirs. And some of the other undercard matches we saw throughout were also I think really well done. It's a tough break. The main event went the way it did, but I still think it's a very enjoyable experience this show overall. Uh, total, you know, Just great storytelling from front to back, especially the stuff with Dangerous Alliance, Rude and Steamboat. Uh, the, tag t uh, the tag matches were really good, except for the really randomized one we had. But besides that, yeah, really strong show. You should go check it out if you haven't.